When we dance, the journey itself is the point. When we play music, you will simply become completely absorbed in sound. And therefore you will find yourself living in an eternal now in which there is no past and there is no future and there is no thing called difference between yourself and the world of nature outside you. Welcome to the Think Space podcast with myself John Staskowski and Danny Massaro where we discuss human nature and the practical application of philosophy. To find out more about our cohort course and membership community please head over to www.thinkspace.academy. We hope you enjoy this episode. This is red, this is green, this is something, this is nothing, this is solid, this is space. Between yourself and the world of nature outside you. Right, so this episode is actually, it's a bit of a reader's request, it's what it feels like it is, because it's inspired by one of my, a good friend of mine who listens to the podcast, listened to the last episode, that actually texted me straight after, saying it was a point where we were talking about nihilism, so it was the, the episode last time was about living in the moment, wasn't it? I think in that you, you had a, not a rant, but you had a bit of a, a dig at nihilism and it in this kind of real dark, dark place that you and some of going, that's not a not the best of ideas. And my mate texted me back and said, God, when Danny went off there about nihilism, and he was sat there thinking, oh, that's me. He really identifies as that kind of a mindset. So we thought we'd do an episode just digging into that a little bit because we threatened to do one on, on absurdism anyway, didn't we? So we thought we'd just cover both of them. So just to start us off, a little definition of the, the, the almost like textbook definition of nihilism. So what, what that means, or what typically what it means, life is inherently meaningless and nothing matters. There's no point trying to create meaning. So that's typically what people mean when they talk about nihilism. And it's often seen with a bit of a as a bit of a dark and destructive philosophy, as it were. And absurdism adds on to that a little bit. So absurdism says life is inherently meaningless and nothing matters, including the fact that nothing matters. So defy life by living the way that you want to. So that's how absurdism would would almost like build on top of or go like a level above nihilism. So when I was texting my mate, that's kind of what I was saying. Or maybe maybe you should look at absurdism as a kind of a next step to maybe get you out of this nihilistic point of view. So and you and I only started then doing some reading and listening this week as we did. And it's weird because we both we've both definitely not got more of a positive outlook on nihilism than we definitely had previously. And we'll get into why and, and what that looks like. But yeah, I think previously we were both all about, yeah, absurdism was a way to go. And nihilism is just dark. It's it's, it's not a good place to put yourself. But now we're, we're maybe doubting that a little bit and maybe seeing some of the positive aspects of, of nihilism. So that's what we're going to have a chat about today. And Danny, you can start us off because a lot of your PhD was around essentially existentialism, really, wasn't it? And we've both got our experiences all and ideas about using absurdism as a as a bit of a life philosophy. So we'll talk about that. But I don't know if you just want to start us off with how you've maybe used it and especially for emerging from your PhD more recently. I went down the, uh, you know, looking at what is it to live a good life from all the original philosophers and, and so on, you know, the Greeks, and read around it a lot, and then came across existentialism, and part of that, not that he was an existentialist, Camus, you know, most of the existentialists said they weren't existentialists, which is weird, but it, let, what, let's say that they thought existentially anyway, which basically means that what is it to be here? What is it to be around? What is it to be on the earth? What is it to be a human being? Heidegger famously called it, you know, Dasein, which is you're a being here and you, you know you have a past and you know you have a future and all that weighs on you and you've got to make plans and Sartre's, you know, thing about facticity and transcendence that you are and you are and at the same time you are and you are not yet you know you are both of those and that's ambiguous and it's that tension between those two two places we talked a bit about it last time didn't we about you know i'm i it been i am who i am and i'm satisfied with my life and i can just dive into my current pleasures and my current life as it stands but i am also like 
my projects. I am also my future self at the same time. I, I am what I am not yet. I am what I will become. I am what I will leave behind one day and, and my legacy. So we're, we're, we're beings, you know, you know, this concept through time. Therefore, people have felt overwhelmed with that. Obviously, you know, the, Simone de Beauvoir said one of the reasons we long sometimes and get nostalgic for our childhood years you know, and they were the good days and, you know, you sent a good article about that, didn't you, this week about how you always think that the good days are, are you know, the old good days and that, you know, now are, now are the good old days as well, you know, but we, we're nostalgic. And part of that is because we want to go back to being the child. We want to be where we just got up in the morning. We were just a kid. We didn't really have much existential weight of our futures and so on. So what that leads to, when you get a bit older and a bit like serious, shall we say, or you think too much, you know, like we do, or, you know, you're just a bit of a, just a bit of a ponderer, or you're just worrying a lot about, you know, you get this sort of low level well-being, poor well-being, we can talk about a bit more lately. So you feel the existential type way, you think a lot and, and you're there, you know, overwhelmed. So then one of the, one of the things that's become fashionable is to have meaning that life therefore is you know is just about create meaning have a meaningful purposeful life so people go around going, oh what's your purpose what's your meaning now obviously in times gone by the meaning of life in many cases was was religion it was well the meaning of the whole universe the meaning of life is to be a good person and go to heaven or avoid hell and all these things or to do this and that but you know, people questioned that as, as as times went on, and it became a lot more about, you know, well, no, cre create your own meaning. It, you know, absurdity really was the things that you're doing don't really have any grand meaning in the grand scheme of the universe. There is none. But in terms of absurdity, you know, you make meaning for yourself. So if you want to be like the best artist, you want to be, you want to be an unbelievable range of things you can be. You know, you go, you go for that, and it is meaningful. So, if it's meaningful to you, then there is meaning in the world, but there is no grand meaning, and that was what Camus was saying. And I found that really interesting from a from a perspective of sport, because you know, absurdism brings in the in the elements of things just happen outside of your control. If you look at the current situation in Ukraine, you know, one week you're living and everything's like nice village and all and suddenly someone's nicking your village and blowing you up. And it's like, hang on a minute. And everyone's saying, in this day and age, in this day, you know, coronavirus came out of nowhere. Uh, I was watching the snooker last week um, and two people won the two tournaments that were on. But no one would ever, ever have picked. The odds were phenomenal for these two players both to win these two. That's, that's an absurdity of, of, of everyone saying this, that, and the other. Gary Neville said that Everton would be the dark horse this season and, and nearly win the league. What a pin act. You know, it's, absurdism is luck, chance, strangeness, forces, acting, that after it's happened, you can kind of retrofit some explanation as to why. Whereas I felt in sport, Sometimes there is room to just accept that things are absurd. So that was what I was talking about in my PhD, bringing in, I try and personally remind players of that a lot, you know, that not every single thing is always in their control. I get that you find meaning in your careers. I get that Rafa Nadal, you know, or Djokovic wants to be the all-time greatest tennis player because that's really meaningful to their family and their country and it tells a story. But at the same time, you're just hitting a, a you know a bag of a bag of air across a net for your job. You know it's it's absurd, really. You were put into a time where it was probably lucky that you 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 got good resources, good coaching. Certain things happened that led you to just being in that right time at the right place to become that kind of person. So I think there's always room for that, and I think that that can bring a little bit of humility back to things and a little bit of humour. And, I, and it takes away from being totally like a control freak and totally serious. So that's where the absurdism came in. And I didn't really do any nihilism in my research. It's interesting how you said, well, because a lot of sports people are often quite religious, are they? They use religion as a, as a real almost crux, don't they, for what they're doing. And they, they take a lot of meaning for it. Often they'll, you know, you often see players, you know, thanking God and stuff when they win or, you know, even when they lose and stuff. It's, it's almost out of their hands, isn't it? But that's one thing with Camus. He was all he was very 
anti-religion, wasn't he? He he called it intellectual suicide or philosophical suicide. If you if you realise that there's no meaning to anything, and then you almost I I read it as a little bit. It's almost like you sell your soul and go right. Well, I'll just put all the meaning into that religion because it gives me a a doctrine to follow and it gives me these future things that I can aim for. But you're almost then that's irrational. You're kind of giving up that rational thought about your own life and what you're doing. And he was outsourcing it to a religion or a someone else or something else. And he was very against that. He he saw that as intellectual suicide, which I wouldn't say that I like, but I quite it resonated with me a little bit. It's like, no, that's that's kind of you're selling out, just embrace it. That's not that's not what it is to be human. Yeah, well life's full of like shocks and disappointments and, and frights and worries and doubts and you know, it's it's full of that. So without going full what full traditional or Schopenhauer, full traditional, you know, life's just rubbish deal and be going down the more traditional version of nihilism. You know, when I speak to someone and say, oh, we're doing a chat on nihilism, they go, oh, God, you know, absurdity. They go, what's that? But nihilism, everyone tends to know it's like you're just giving up and everything's black and dark. Have you ever seen The Big Lebowski, the film? I haven't, though. No. I've heard of it. That, that was my first... The first thing that I tend to think of when I would think about nihilism that is a it's a good film it's a Coen Brothers film Jeff Bridges and John Goodman it's quite a funny film and part of the thing in that there's this group of nihilists who are hunt, they're trying to track him down they're one of the main characters in there and they were this real almost comic book representation of like real hardcore German nihilists all wore kind of like leather look like I had an gear kind of thing and they were just like just didn't care about anything, nothing mattered, just do what they want, just hammering people for when they're collecting money from them and stuff. Uh, and that that's tend to be what I would think of with, with nihilists, these really like almost like lunatics who just don't care about anything because nothing matters. So they just do what they want, take what they want, do what they want, no consequences because nothing matters. So why would you be bothered? How does that con- compare to the Fight Club film? You know, the Fight Club is famous for a certain branch of. Very different. That's Fight Club's a lot more. Big Lebowski's a bit more of a comedy, I would say. So they're almost the the like caricatures of a yeah. But the, the philosophy of, of Fight Club because I, most people know that. Yeah, well, it's similar, isn't it? That you know the, that that was essentially a group of blokes, wasn't it? Getting together because they didn't have any meaning in their lives, but they felt like they were alive and so it was smacking yeah. them in the face. I suppose. I don't know if I don't know if you'd say that was nihilist though, would you? Fight club. Well, the absurdism of the Camus, it was a, it was a, what, taking a, it was a rejection, trying to revolt against the mundane. So whilst there's no grand grand total meaning and no you know end game that's ultimately meaningful in the world, you know, and the planets, you know, they don't care what happens to themselves. You know, there's many organisms on our planet now; they don't care what happens. But humans, particularly, think, oh gosh, it's all got to mean something. It's all we've got to. You know, all these little things I'm doing has to end up meaning a big thing. Otherwise, I'm wasting a life. Fan Club was good for that, I think. So it, yeah. it shone a light on that consumerist bullshit almost, didn't it? Of products and, you know, aspiring for those, but ultimately it means nothing. But that's what you're told, you know, work for 30 years and get your attention and this is what you should be doing and that's a meaningful life. I think Fight Club definitely shone a light on that. Yeah. So it was like a taking over of... Don't wait around for some grand special gift from the gods one day. You know, this Nietzsche thing, or, you know, like I, I'll actually have a good time while I'm on the earth. You have a good time in heaven. That's what he talked about with slave morality. It was like people have bought into this ultimate grand meaning once they pass, pass away, pass on um, in, in, in death. But it's like, uh, but we'll rule you, you know, you be slaves, we'll rule you and have a good time while we're alive deal <laughs> you know so you know there was this that the, the fight club i suppose they were fighting back and saying no we're going to do it how we want to do it now and that was what Camus was saying he was like you know live like live optimally go for it so it wasn't depressing absurdity is not it's not depressing to say oh you you know yeah I've, I'm, I'm the one of the stories i put in my book was a uh, the guy who I worked with, he won a US Open squash tournament and he was a bit buzzing off it, really happy. Oh, I'm amazing. We went to the restaurant and his coach said to him, you know, why are you getting all big and cocky? Like no one in this restaurant even knows what squash is. You know, you hit a ball against a wool for a job. So just pipe down, you know, 
And it kind of, it was like everyone was shocked and like, oh my God, because, you know, he's a bit of the hero of the moment in our crowd. The coach just cut, used that kind of absurdity to not, to just take him down a peg. Obviously, didn't just say, did full on attack that squash is a completely nihilistic, meaningless activity that only him gets a buzz off and no one will ever care in the future about it. So yeah, so absurdity is a bit more, if you're too, if you're taking yourself too seriously and you're looking for this grand, bigger, you know, you're just like, hang on a minute, this isn't, this isn't life or death here. You just, or you were even a bit lucky. So absurdity can bring balance, but it can also bring a lot of joy and a lot of gumption to, to like go after your own projects really well. And obviously syphysis and pushing the boulder up the hill to let it roll down, push it back up, let it, you know, it's condemned to push the boulder up the hill all his life. But it was like find meaning and purpose in the fruit, futile task of, of, of what you're doing. So Camus, although he'd been brought up and, you know, in Algeria and had seen a lot of war and probably that's what sent him thinking this way um, he was actually a joyous character and he was about go for it so um yeah the nike stuff you know just do it and all that stuff you could you know they're all Camus type stuff Nietzschean type stuff as well because Camus like Nietzsche and all this ubermensch thing be your own god create meaning for yourself go for it transcend yourself you know become the become the lion and become the you know then return to the child and become fun and you know, live life while you're here full on so that's that now how do you see that difference to this new bit of nihilism that you've well it's interesting when you say about Camus because you know I think we did mention it in the last episode how because we talked about you know like Buddhism and like the gurus and the yogis they're very alluring yeah. characters aren't they you know we mentioned like yeah. walks and the way they speak and and then the message it, it hooks you in. Yeah. I think we used the Dalai uh, Lama's quote, didn't we? And then it, you just kind of you kind of buzz off that as, as these like, characters. And mm-hmm. I do find Camus a little bit like that, you know. But it's interesting. I I've, I've seen it because he mainly speaks French, doesn't it? I, I don't think I've seen an English him speaking English in like an interview, which is more my ignorance and anything that I don't understand French, but. There's not that level of a loop, but he looked quite a cool guy, didn't it? And I think he has this persona or this image of he was like the cool, rebellious, almost like a James Dean type character, where you had Sartre and Blavat, and they were very like almost like weird characters. I think physically they, they just looked a little bit different, and they're quite odd sometimes. And I quite like as well how Camus had like a bit of a a, a battle with Sartre, and it's almost like. He, you go, which side do you take? Because Sartre you know, was, had these huge coming on that. Bit. And I find myself rooting for Camille. I find it really like, even though I've never really seen him much. It's all the fact pictures and then some of things that you read. Yeah. But also when you read it is philosophy. And I don't know what about, but it definitely resonates with me. Just that whole element of, of buzzing off. The fact that life is meaningless and actually seeing that as quite humorous, which we've talked about before, seeing the humor in that. And actually finding that as like, it's funny and it's, it, it gives me almost like motivation. Whereas like you said, when you mentioned nihilism to people, it's like, oh God, it's like down and straight away. Well, maybe, maybe it brings relief because it's not really, I don't feel relief from it. I feel, I feel it more as, because I don't, I don't ever feel like I had something I needed relief from. Do you know what I mean? It's not like I've ever had that real no. existential angst where you're just like, oh God, like what's the point of this? Maybe you didn't personally, but you do grow up and it's all around you, isn't it? In Western, you know, church and school, aim up, aim big, be somebody, become something, you know, don't waste your time. You know, that it, you have to get to a certain age before you can almost turn back in on yourself and go, you know what, I'm just happy doing this. Like, go out, play me a little bit of golf, walk the dog, go, earn my money doing that, don't need too much. You almost go into your own projects, and you, you, and you know. You, but I definitely think Camus and the and the absurdism. What I liked about it is it's an action orientated thing. It's like, right, come on, get out there and do what you want to do, and, and and you have to take part in finding your own meaning of it. And obviously, then linked in ultimately again to the logo therapy, meaning therapy, which we might look at next time with Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning. Now, the nihilist, okay, so you've got Man's Search for Meaning as a title of a book written by Viktor Frankl. Millions read it, love it. Uh, most people who ever read that book just go, 
what a book. That's basically saying man lives. As long as man has meaning in his life, you find things meaningful, then you can endure anything, basically, within his experience of going through the, the camps. You know, you can't argue with the guy. He's been through it, and that's his opinions. That's his phenomenological experience, and that's what he's come up with, and he's found his, his therapy really useful. Saying that, you, you, we've just read some stuff on nihilism this week, and I know you've got it like pretty down as well. You know, you like it a lot. How does the night? How does this new version of this sunny nihilism, or what you, you know, what you've understood this week, last week, contrast with like the Camus branch, you know, the absurdism and this you know, that meaning is important, and you need to believe in something meaningful to live a good life. How, where do you see the nihilism opposite to that? Well, one phrase we've used, I've always from different bits that we've read, is sunny nihilism. That, that to me is absurdism. So you can have the real dark, hopeless element of, of the, the tradition of what people might think of as nihilism. But a lot of people now are talking about sunny nihilism, which to me, it's like, well, isn't that just absurdism? Uh, Camus talks about living life with passion, which I quite like. And that, so that to me is like passion. Passion is like a sunny word, isn't it? Straight away, you can almost feel that heat, and warmth, and right, let's sun and let's go, let's not let's live with passion. So that appeals to me. And he, because I, I noted down when I, when I was reading bits of that, and I was like, well, yeah, for me, that's like living with curiosity. So having a bit of curiousness just about the world and life and people. And, and that does involve then thinking about what are we doing here? What is the point? Is there a purpose? Is the meaning? Yeah. Being interested in philosophy. So living a philosophical life, I think, is part of living with passion for me. And then the big thing that we've been, obviously for the past few months, yeah. are with the Think Space course and everything, that level of authenticity. So I say, are you living? So living with passion to me would be, are you living your authentic, true life? So you're not doing stuff just from the sake of it. There's that funny, I think it's a Dilbert cartoon. I think I, I will have sent you it before where it's, it's the bloke sat on the couch with his talk in the, in the cartoon and he's saying, he's talking about his, his job being meaningless essentially and then the dog kind of makes the quip of all well, how much you know if you can quit your job and I'll give you meaning are you going to do that and the guy's like no <laughs> and he's like well that tells you how much meaning's worth you know in this kind of consumerist in, industrialised thing it's like yeah you're saying it won't mean it but if I offered you it you wouldn't you'd rather have the money. So that's part of that authenticity of actually, yeah, well, no, I can. I am willing to give up material goods or chasing big paychecks and, and status and things like that to just live more in line with, with what, I, what I want to do. That, for me, is quite sunny nihilism, but it's almost an absurdism. So, so, the, the, so sunny nihilism, that version of nihilism, let's say there's different versions of it, that's kind of like close to absurdism, which is basically... There is no, there is no meaning in the whole universe, but and yeah, your projects. Yeah, so I, I would be fully on board with there is no meaning. There is the, the universe has no purpose whatsoever. Right. There is no end to the journey that we're heading, and we're all going to achieve this thing, or the universe has got an end goal in mind. I suppose so. That for me would be really nihilistic. I'm, 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 I'm happy and find it quite funny that the universe was will basically get blown up in however many billions of years and, and nothing will exist that ever yeah. did exist whether it's people we know or anything anyone who has ever existed there will be no recollect record of that that's so point. i find that quite funny and empowering rather than and that that's getting more a lot of people find that really scary and and do, they get a feeling of dread and doom obviously because it's you know or, or you might think you know i'm not going to be here one day or this isn't really going to amount to anything, you know, on a small scale. But Anaya, so, but, you know, I was, we were listening to the sort of couple of people this week that were really full on nihilism with that, yeah. with like really joyous, a bit like you. What was it? What was their version like? Well, how do you deal with that? So, how, how, why is it making you feel like good? I don't know. Then? It's free, that it's quite free, and I think. So, it's free in book. It, in that sense, it gives you freedom as well. It just takes, not, again, not that I've ever really felt like I've had that baggage of what am I here for? What should I be doing? You know, what's my purpose? Mm. And that's, well, anyone our age and living in this society, you are, that is given to you a lot of the time, isn't it? You all are, there's expectation on us as people in, in, the, in a Western society. We have, there's expectations on what we should do. 
especially with, with regards to work and careers and progression, you're almost seen. You should be on this upward trend, shouldn't you? And it's usually the older you get, the more money that you're earning and the higher your status is within the industry that you work. That's a, that's explicit, but it's also quite subtle a lot of the time, isn't it? Because you go back to school, it's like everything's next level. So, right, you do this and then you'll get that. And then when you do this exam, you'll get that. And then that'll get you this and then you'll get into yeah. there. And then from that, you'll do this and then you'll get that job. It's like the old Alan Watts, one of his speeches, isn't it? constantly striving moving forward and then his thing which is quite existential is you get there and realize oh i think he uses din on your music doesn't it the music playing and then if you went to a concert and the, the guy just came on and did the the symbols at the end to end the song about what was that it's about the music that gets you to that point but i find that quite free yeah you want the whole so so let me carry on and prod in because if then a lot of people would say, what's the meaning of life? They normally come up with an answer, don't they? they There's not many people go, absolutely nothing. They go, my children or love or to be nice to people or to contribute to society, to have fun, as much fun as you can whilst you're here, an Epicurean type thing or had any stick view on life. What is the meaning of life to you? There isn't one. It, 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 well, it, it's that absurdist view of you just decided. So if I... Yeah, it is totally individual to you. There is no the meaning of life is what you decide it to be, or the meaning of life even isn't even that. But it's just while you're here, you have some preferences, and you just do them. Right. There are there is no meaning whatsoever. You, but whilst you're here, that's not dark because later on, I'm cooking tea and I'm doing a new recipe, and I just love it. And tomorrow, I'm in some golf balls, and I love doing it. It don't mean anything. No, well, I don't. I, I happily do stuff knowing that there's no ultimate meat. Yeah. Camus, he had his three things, didn't he? Or his three options. It was because everyone fundamentally recognizes that absurd, that absurdity in what it is to be a human being. Camus would say that that's wrong. What we've, what you've, you know, Camus would say, no, find meaning in your golf and in your cookery as it can leave, you know, like you, you're contributing to some long-term cookery development idea and it's you're leaving recipes for your family very meaningful was a nihilist says yeah cook but don't for a minute think that you know leaving a a recipe behind means anything you just you're just lying to yourself and i think that's what i'm i'm meaning by t- my my kind of thinking about meaning is i'm well aware there is no ultimate meaning to that so it, it's irrelevant what i do in my life, essentially, because at some point the sun's going to explode the earth or whatever, and the sun gets to the Yeah. Well, that's that macro level, big picture thing, isn't it? But in the moment, whatever I'm doing is clearly because I feel that this, for me individually, in this moment, that's just how I want to spend my time. And that has some meaning to me. But I would be well aware yeah. that you could look at that and go, what's the point of that? What's he doing that for? Yeah. That doesn't bother me. It's like, well, because this is just how I want to spend my time. Yes. It has meaning on that individual micro level, but ultimately it's irrelevant. So, oh, you know, you've, you've got a dog, you love your dog, you, you know, the dog ends up having a great life, dog passes away. Do you find meaning in the fact that you gave that dog a really good, well lived existence because of the things you did? Does that carry with you for the next 30 years? Or are you just not even thinking much about that? Just thinking, I enjoyed the dog while it were there, now it's not here, I've got another dog. Not as not as not as brutal as that, but kind of yeah. I've always I've always been a bit like that, you know, with in terms of grief and stuff. Yeah. So when you have like close family members, uh, you know, like grandparents and stuff. When you're a, as, as a kid, is a big one, isn't it? We were really close to our. And this is some of Polish grandparents, but I would notice how I would just deal with that better than other members of my family. And, it, and I don't think it was because I was thinking weird, or they were because mm-hmm. it, it was just. I think I was just more in tune with that. And it's clearly that at 15, 16, you haven't got a clear who Albert Camus is or yeah. any of these people or philosophers. You just kind of run with through your life, can't you? And it's only in retrospect that I'm then assigning any meaning to those yeah. experiences. But yeah, I've always been quite level. So rather than having big ups where you're buzzing on, on top of the world and everything's like Nirvana, on massive laws and depra- I've always been quite. Well, it's interesting yeah. because in a silly way that that's like it's kind of an an antidote to uh, people who suffer a lot of grief 
because they're replaying this thing or fear that something might not mean anything or add up to things. And I, that, I suppose in a way, that's what I've tried to do with athletes, the ones that have a propensity to over-dramatize and get too down and, and, and basically get it out of proportion. You know, you'd sometimes use absurdity to bring some humor into it, to go, what are we doing here? Look at us back in New York or back in, you know, doing, doing this and who the... Well, what's just happened over there? Like as if, as if anyone would have predicted that happening. And you, and you know, and you can just laugh and let go. But I still want you to really win this match. And if you win this tournament, you'll be the first English player to win this tournament in so many years. And I know me and you were going to carry that feeling for a long, long, long time. So I like the absurdism part where you can like go, yeah, in so many, many, many ways, it completely doesn't matter. But in our way, for us. We know it's, we're going to carry that on. I know, you know, if it was my dog, I'd be always probably looking back, feeling, oh, my God, I miss it, and, oh, and, well, wow, we did have good times, and so on and so forth. I, I see the nihilist, the nihilist as a little bit more not wrong. No, it's definitely not wrong. I think the argument that they make is solid because there's no counterproof to what nihilists say. But I find that experientially in their lived experience, there might be a little bit more of a calculated coolness to how they operate in their lives. And when you're emotional and life's about emotion and stories and meaning, it's quite hard to, to, to chat with a nihilist because it's quite, seems really cold and which, which therefore is associated with being really dark. And I think the learning for me is, is that the nihilists that I've listened to and talked to and they're not always depressed people. They're not dark. They're not down on humanity. Often anything but. They're simply just saying, it doesn't mean anything though. <laughs> you know, and it's, it goes counter to a lot of the narratives, doesn't it, about religion and life. And I think it's very uncomfortable if you've been brought up just presuming that there is a mighty, a mighty purpose apart from, no, there isn't. It's literally just enjoy what you do and then it's gone. Because one day the sun's going to blow us all up. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, it's a bit like to look at I think of that. I, I, you know, don't destroy all of me. I'm, here I am thinking that I'm heading towards some grand cosmic tablet that's going to be talked about for billions of years of my, my existence. <laughs> it's got to mean something. <laughs> It's a lot like, you know, like the Stoics, though, when they, so a big part of that, a Stoicism is that it's almost like imagining stuff. You're on about, like, say, your dog, your pet dog diet. You know that's going to happen. You, you can pretty well, well, you know for a fact that we all know a dog has a life of maximum, yeah. say, 15, 16, if it's lucky. So you know within that time it's going to die. And the Stoics almost say, imagine that's just happened, or that put yourself in that position that you, your dog's dead and it doesn't exist. No, I don't think I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't call myself a stoic, but again, I think that's maybe part of the freedom of stuff like absurdism and even nihilism because it helps you do that. You go, yeah, I know my dog is going to die at some point, but I'm not going to spend the next fifteen years worrying that that moment's mm -hmm. going. So, so there's definitely meaning in your relationship with your dog. All right, well, I don't know why I'm focusing on dogs, but any, any relationship in your life, and it people yeah. everything. You know that there's pain. Your legacy, your reputation, your career, you know, the one that, the, how attached you are to what you think your story is and your narrative and, and what you stand for, what you will be remembered for, what they will say at your funeral. And, you know, these things are all about how you play with time and, and people, some people need that. But you're right, bringing stoicism is interesting because at the end of the day, stoicism is a way of life and, and like cynicism, all these other things. But, as I see it, they're all just sets of tricks to basically try and escape the tension of the ambiguity of existence, the constant ambiguity. And that's where I love Simone de Beauvoir's uh, the, you know, ambiguity of ethics. In her book, she lays out ways in which that we've tried to do that. And she, she said nihilism is one way that we try and bypass the, the tension we feel about, oh, deep down, I am worried, but I'm, I'm, I can't admit it or... I'm, I'm not worried at all. What's wrong with me? I must be must be a you know psychopath or something, or you know I, I I I do really care about what's happening in Ukraine. But as soon as that football match just kicked off, I'm more bothered about whether we win that match. What's wrong with me? 
you know, we're like, we're, we're, we're like, you know, it's weird. It's like, we're so complicated. You know, one one minute you're watching the news and it, and it's like, you know, this is massive thing, terrible in the world's going to happen. And then within a minute, the news read, you know, on BBC Breakfast, they've said, oh, this is Sarah who's just won Great British Bake Off. And they're just buzzing about it. And it's absurd because it's like, but you, as a human, you, you, you're left with this sort of like, is it important? Is it not? What's wrong with it? Quite hard, this tension of not, you know, you are who you are and you are, in, you are not yet. You're an individual, but you're also part of a society, part of a community that you need. Loads of, you would not be here if it weren't for loads, so many people. You just wouldn't be here, but you act like you're a really individual person and I've got myself together, so that's all that matters. And and one minute you're like, no, I owe people a lot of things. And then you're like, no, I don't. You don't owe anybody anything. I am somebody because I'm the I'm the gold medal rower. And then the next day, after a few days, when you come bronze medal or got nowhere on the next Olympics, it's like, oh, God, I am no, what's wrong with me? All these weird tensions and things we're constantly going through is that ambiguity of living. And you know, like when we when I had, when we when Laura got pregnant, my wife here it was like, uh, oh gosh, first scan, oh this is gonna be worrying. And the mayor just went, you'll never not be worrying now forever. And you're like, oh I don't know if I want that. He says, but you will have a lot of joy. You will have all the joy. But you will have all the worry. So you're thinking, oh my God, life is so much simpler before this. Which one do I want? Do I get busy living or get busy sort of dying philosophically? You know, there's this old road bridge and just basically be me on my own thinking one day the sun's going to blow up. So nothing matters, nothing matters. Comfortable with that. I've solved life. Nothing means anything. I'm there. And that's what the Beauvoir criticized the nihilist for. She said the nihilist thinks it's a, it's a trap. The nihilist thinks they've solved life by saying there's no meaning in anything, but they're finding meaning in being the nihilist. So it's just a, it's just another little trap and trick they played on themselves to temporarily cause, cause, you know, like clarity from an ambiguous state. That that's 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 that person's experience. So she, although she was criticising that as a as a sort of trap, uh, and but I suppose if like the Buddhist or anyone who goes full on into one way of life, a stoic, a hedonist. You know, who's anybody else to say that that's not what to do for you? But as a, as talking generally, I just see it as a all these philosophies and all these things are just tricks and 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 like tools to try and ultimately squirm out of your waking constant ambiguity. You open as well you know and because of because your own personality is weird isn't it and things and your own situations are strange so it, it's how do you No, because i see what you mean with the tricks and that and i agree a lot of them it, it gives you something to cling to doesn't it a bit like camus said with the religion it's almost like well i don't need to think about all that because if i just put every if i just go all in both feet with this religion or whatever it might be it's like i could just forget about that stuff and just but he's, he's calling that intellectual suicide. You know, I've talked about cults, haven't we, a lot, and cults. Yeah, so that's why they appeal and gurus and everything. Yeah, I found the answer. This just delineates all the ambiguity because, and you're chanting and you've, you know, you've found God and you, what you, this new version of something, whether that's uh, atheism or, it could, it could be, it could be, it can be soul, minimalism, veganism. It can, it can be anything can be taken to a following in an extreme simplicity. I suppose that's where you're getting into, I don't know whether you'd call that too, you, you, once you start going into fundamental levels of some of these things, that's where it maybe gets knotted up. Very in ways of thinking about stuff. But but like Nietzsche said, there's this, if you're not careful, these charismatic leaders and these philosophies and these books that you get at the airports, and these theories and all, you know, and maybe even in sport, you know, all these answers that people throw at you, this model of learn, this model, that that branch, this this way of doing it, this is what... They become so appealing because you, you're a bit lost and you just want to escape the unknown, the confusion and the anxiety. So you just go, oh, if I got to found this book about mindset, it's absolutely the best book I've ever read. And then two months later, you're on something else. Because you realise that he hasn't quite done it, and then you need a new guru and or a new philosophy. That that in itself, you can't blame people for doing that. But I think 
critically thinking about things is playing with all these ideas, but being really, really highly, highly skeptical and suspicious of yourself more than anything for falling for these things because they're so appealing. But I think for me, that's where the freedom that I talked about comes from. So feeling free and feeling it as a sense of freedom. Camus did talk about how it's almost like our curse as human beings. That, And it's, if you think it's why we where you can sat here having this conversation, it's because people were instilled with this inherent sense of a need for meaning and purpose. That made them go out and find food that day, didn't it? And build a house and, cause it, and then you know, pass yeah. all the genes and, and, and that's how societies grew. So yeah. that's kind of the reason we are so successful as a species. But that's our curse because you can't then escape it. Yeah. So we need an hour. We don't need to, you know, you and I don't need to go out tonight and, and hunt to put food on the table. That inherent purpose that it serves to continually strive on, and it's not about life and death anymore. It's like, well, do I want to be the CEO of this company? Do I want to win that tournament or become this level in the industry that I work in? But that's irrelevant. You're still going to eat that day. You're still going to have heat. But that, that, so you can see how that means it served the purpose. Now, is it freeing for me? Because if you if you have thought about it and you weighed it up and then you get to that point where you actually, yeah, it's just absurd, isn't it? But I've got to do summer. I'm here. I know, I know I'm going to eat. I know, I know I don't need to go and hunt or whatever. I'm comfortable. Mm. So I, might, I have to do something to spend the time. Otherwise, Camus said, well, your other option is you've got intellectual suicide, so find religion. Or just actual suicide. It's like once you realise that absurdity, it's like right. Well, I'll just kill myself because there's yeah. no point. There's no me. Yeah, it's a blessing. it's a blessing and a curse to be uh, think so so like futuristically and, and you know and that's another bit of ambiguity. But the reason I like the um, the absurdity at the moment I might change, you know, obviously. But the reason I like the absurdism over the nihilism is is that it's actually joyous, even if you're deluding yourself. It's joyous to find meaning in things. It's an extra layer of joy, you know, because it's like, to, for me, it feels warmer it, and it feels more, it can be more social and it can be more lasting. And, and, and I might be deluding myself and it might, like you say, when the sun blows up, no one cares. But whilst I lived, I felt like I contributed to a higher thing, even though it might be complete BS, and you could tear it to pieces logically and all of that. In myself, you know, I found I found having the meaning an extra layer of pleasure and joy and warmth and emotional thing. Whereas the nihilist says, no, nah, don't you don't get that extra layer, but what you do get, you get no ambiguity because you're dead intellectually straight, and you get a real no self delusion because you're always, you know, you know nothing means anything. So that's a bonus. Uh, and just do things because it's a, a preference. So it's kind of simple. But I prefer to feel that, you know, helping a player win some squash tournament because of the work I've done, and then they help two other people. I feel like that, for me, is, is, is like making me feel like, you know, there he lived, you know, and he, 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 he helped people as he travelled through life. I mean, absolute bollocks, but... But it's still the helping them that makes you. Yeah, it's not the help them, is it? It's that you felt good from helping them. So there's yeah, if there's a selfishness in that, well, that's a little different to me making a cup of tea and going, oh, this is a really, um, this is a proper nice brew that I've made here. Yeah, it might well, but I'm enjoying it. You're just getting enjoyment from the feeling of oh, well, I helped that person and they and they did well. They're not no different to hitting a golf ball around the middle of a fairway. In that moment, there is no meaning to it, but in that moment for you, you're like. The feeling and everything about feelings. I like the meeting. I like the chat. I like, I like this, what we're doing, right? And then join this chat, buzzing, and you're buzzing, and it's good. But I also like the thought that someone's going to be listening to it and I'm going to maybe help their life. And they were, you know, and, and therefore I'm creating like meaning for myself, thinking I'm kind of a good guy in the world, helping people, and I'm contributing to critical thinking and that, that's I mean that that's just me being adding on like silly layers of extra meaning you're right a nihilist because if you just it's just that's just nothing Danny that, that's not true but I'm I, as I exist I, I like living that way 
I like del- I like the delusion. I like feeling like there is something bigger. I like that. I'm, it's attractive to me. Although I've never really been religious, but I do like I do like the idea of it, and I can understand why people feel warm and connected, and they love the idea of you know whatever it is. So I, as where I, I think nihilism is good and it's right, and you can't argue with it, but I, I do think it's a bit slightly self delusional in in trying to be. Uh, so clean and and factual about things. I think there's things that they missed out on, but I suppose they would argue they'd rather miss out on delusion and just have it so simple and straight. I know we don't really like labels, do we? But we, would you call yourself an absurdist at this point in your life? Because I don't. You know what? I think since doing my study, I, I, it's definitely come into my work a lot more. But being really, really honest, I mean. I can talk with talk on all these philosophies and explain them, but what I actually live as a human being, I'm just, I don't know why I am. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm excited, then I'm scared, then I'm happy, then I'm a bit down, then I'm, then I'm ex, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic, I think that's my personality, do things I like. I try and, I like things to go my way all the time, you know, like I think that's your will to power thing, You'd not, not power, power, but, Oh, I just want that result to go that way. And I just want that gas bill to be lower. And I just want them to like me. And I just want them, I just don't want to have to go there on Tuesday and have the day off. I always want things to go my way, you know, and, and I like control. Uh, I don't like doing things that I fail at, you know, that's, that's, you know, I'm not. So I kind of like, uh, but you know, really, really, really comes down to it. You know, I like that saying food first, moral second, you know, like, Ultimately, I can talk about all these philosophies and all that, and they do maybe influence me from time to time. But if if shit got real and I was really down there, I, I, I regress pretty quickly to a I rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like ah, philosophy's useless. You know, like like. But it, day to day, as I think about things, while I'm fortunate enough not to be getting attacked or anything taken off me, you know, living in a comfortable life. You know, I'm like, oh yes, I'm into this philosophy. It really helps me. Yeah. But you know, I'm I'm one attack away from and going down the levels of, of being. But I just I was saying the same. So is is that a bit of the nihilist in us though? Because I kind of almost, and especially with the with the current climate, is with you know politically and the way prices are going and wars. Um... I think that to me, no, I, I, I just think that's just being for me. It's just my experience of being a human. I've always been like that. Oh. Want it to do this, and I like it when that happens, and I don't like it when that happens. But some people fear that, don't they? So some people really would fear that that thing of you said, because I, I can't remember who said it, but it's like everyone's three meals from a riot or something like that. And it's, yeah. You know, so you talked about community before and how everyone yeah. is, is, looks after each other and all that stuff. If it really kicked off and the shops ran out of food properly, people would be like knocking on each other's doors pretty soon. You're know, doing some pretty savage thing, and that's what I mean. The bailist to me kind of almost thinks that would be not a good thing, obviously, but it'd be something because I think it would be interesting for people to realise they had that in them because 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 they don't think about maybe some of these stuff. If you, if you just ignore the absurdity and you outsource it, so maybe you don't think about how real it would get pretty quick. Well, maybe that's why we like, you know, popular on Netflix, isn't it? And all these things like you know mafia things that are so bump. You know, and and post-apocalyptic kind of shows where people are like, you know, there's only 500 lost and things like that. You know, 500 people left, there's zombies walking around. What are you going to do? What would you do if you were in this situation? So those things are popular because I think they make people think, oh, if it did all go like that, what would I be like? I just have a sense in myself that I'd be pretty useless, you know, um, and I, I, I think the scariness of that thought, if I then turn into a nihilist, if I put my nihilist hat on really quick and go, well, it wouldn't mean anything anyway because nothing means anything now and nothing will mean anything then and nothing means anything anyway in all time, it kind of makes me go, oh, that's all right then. Like, bring it on. But when it actually happened, I'd be like going, no, take me back to 19, you know, like 2021 when COVID was on and we... We were having bloody popcorn at home and watching Netflix. You know, I, I, I just, 
And so I'd like to think I'd be like that as a now, oh, no, I'll be more fine, man. You know, you know, it's it'd just be an interesting project for me to watch it. But in reality, I feel like I'd be quickly, you know what I mean? It's easy to talk about these concepts and be critically analyze them, but it's to actually, actually live it. That's when you find out and no one cares how well you can hit a squash ball. Exactly, and I don't want that for When they're knocking on your door, go out and see that food you've got in your fridge there. And <laughs> it. It's like, well, I can hit a squash ball. <laughs> I bought this, you know, how I think I have mentioned before about, you know, people being like soldiers and stuff and they go to war. Are they the ones who are truly forgetting all these like theories and isms that we're talking about? They're the ones who are going back to that inherent. That is the meaning. I've got to do this or he's going to kill me. I kill him or he kills me. I get that and feed my family tonight. I mean, I'd... We're going to starve. That's your purpose. You're not bothered about, oh, yeah. what about this and I'm, is this and I'm... Yeah. It just doesn't even enter you think. Well, it's, it, it's strange, isn't it? When you talk about like mental toughness or attitude, don't be, you, you go like, so like Wayne Rooney, he, he, he'll say this documentary, oh, I grew up on the streets, you had to fight, you had to get everything, that must meant be a fighter. There's loads of people come from those streets that haven't fought for anything. And you get Nadal, who's pretty nice upbringing, uh, and he fights as much as anyone I've ever seen in, in on a court, you know, in tennis, for his points, like he's possessed. But he had a really nice upbringing. It's it's really difficult, you know. Every soldier who's ever been to war, some come back and they're just civvy streets, like just, just so absurd they can't make the, join the link. Some soldiers come back and they just, you know, they don't know. They just, you know, they deal with it and they just float and they don't really get it. So I do think it's really in, inside, and I think that goes down to your own personalities and your own childhood experiences and level how much trauma that you can take. You know how set in your values you are and what you think morals are. So maybe you've a propensity growing up the way you've grown up to have a general lie you said about yourself, just a general kind of default. Yeah, well, you know, I I never really went overboard when some of my family passed. I mean, it didn't they like it, but just kind of accepted it in a weird way and moved on. But I wonder if that comes because I, I mentioned grandparents. As, as a kid, I spent most of my time. It's like summers, I would go with my Polish grandparents, and obviously they. Like World War Two, um, immigrants escaping Hitler or something, yeah. were they? So I wonder. I do wonder sometimes if I just absorbed a lot of that because they had seen so much more yeah. stuff than anything we've had to do. Ooh. Do you kind of imbibe a little bit of that from that attitude of yeah. worst things yeah. happen to see kind of thing, isn't it? Which yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it's not that you have no purpose or meaning. That it's particularly nihilistic. It's maybe just a more balanced outlook on. The ups and downs of yeah, and, and if you know Lisa Feldman Barrett at the moment, she's been talking a lot about you know the brain, and neuroscience, and everything and development. And yeah, it's 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 not nature or nurture. It's like just totally nature and nurture intertwined. Nature times nurture, whatever you want to say. Yeah, you. I think there's a natural disposition there. You know, you 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 know your sister could have had the same experience and not not gone your way. So there's a disposition few things and you never know it could be like it could be one thing that triggers you to go one way in your whole life or it could be it could be like 20 things repeated that do it but yeah i know in my own experience that one of the reasons i do think i got into psychology anyway was and, and so on was because when i was younger i lived on my own from when i was 16 i spent a hell of a lot of time on my own occupying my mind i kind of worked out that my reality was very much affected by how i thought about my reality and I, I you know along with I don't know like my mum mum and dad were splitting up at the time and things and I don't I just I just for some reason remember being a bit upset but no you've got to get on and, and not be a drag and and not like let the pit you know like they're having a tough time like don't add to it so I came this little like this sort of fa- like hero of family hero like I'm the you know I, I you know I know it's all a bit gloomy but you won't find me sulking too much. I'm making something work. And I think that's made me the way I am. But my brother's not like that. You see that in families, don't you? Same things and different. That is in the mix when you think about a philosophy. You know, let maybe maybe certain philosophies are attractive to you because of the way you are. I mean, I think that's an obvious thing to say. And then you just find you just carry on sticking up for it as much as you can because it's the one that makes most sense to you. But it, but it, and it's hard to to sometimes 
switch that later on in life because it's the way you've always lived. You would think, what have I been doing for 40 years thinking that? And it can be very unnerving and unsettling. And it can probably feel very disorientating as well in terms of things you've done, lives you've led, things you've said, things you've published. You know what I mean? You can feel a bit like, what have I done? Like a fraud and you can get a lot of shame and regret and, oh, you idiot, and, and cringe about yourself if you change too much. But I don't think you, I, I don't think it, that you should go full on massive, you know, change, but always be open to a little bit of, you know, don't feel too guilty if, you know, you used to believe in things and philosophies and then, well, oh, actually, I've changed my mind a little bit. I've gone a bit softer than I used to be. You know, I actually do think there's a bit of meaning in things now because I've just, you know, done, gone through that experience. I think that's lovely about life, that you can change your values as you as you develop and, and change your philosophies as, as, as you go through experiences rather than almost putting up a brick wall or any other philosophy that comes slightly in just bounces off you because you're so entrenched. I think I'm surfing that line between sunny nihilism and absurdism. I don't I don't really like the label because and identifying with the label of it, but I think that's currently where I am at this point. I'm embracing the embracing the futility of of life as it were and seeing that as a freedom. And then like you say, you might change in a few years' time or months, weeks time, but that's where I am now. I don't know if what we've talked about then helps my mate who was feeling like he was all nihilistic. <laughs> There's, I mean, look, there's, there's just being pissed off as well, isn't there? It's not a philosophy. There's just being pissed off and down and negative and watching too much crap and your brain not looking forward to anything. We all go through that, but I suppose if that goes on all the time, it's not a philosophy. You just feel shit. You're just down. Yeah. You're just down. And you and then, and then all you can see is everything's bleak. Don't tap yourself and sleep and eat well and get yourself optimal. And, you know, regardless of philosophy, you've still got to be a, 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 like a healthy organism. So yeah, sometimes I think when people say, "Oh, I've got dead nihilistic," I don't. I just I don't think they're nihilistic. I think they just got pissed off. <laughs> oh, you know, I get that in sport. They lose a few games. Oh, oh, oh. and it's like, yeah, well, you're going to be down. You're not winning. You've lost, and your status is down. You're flipping, feeling a bit mad because they're winning and you're not. Like you need a good win. Have a couple of good wins, and you'll be you, you'll soon change your philosophy on the world. You know, you know what I mean? So we, we can we can over intellectualize it at the end of the day. I mean, well, I think that's where something like absurdism can help because it some of the stuff that was pissing you off or you were down or you could start to say, well, that, yeah. it's absurd to me. Yeah, it can pull you out. It zooms you out. It can pull you out. Yeah. But it, well, what I mean is, even a full on absurdist or a full on nihilist surely can have good days and bad yeah. days. You can still have moods yeah. and, like, oh, for God's sake. You know, no matter how, you know, that's, that's the, you know, like as if Jesus, you know, whatever, even, you know, never on a bad day. I mean, he clearly does, doesn't he? You see it in, in, at times. So there's nothing that can, there's nothing that can be like, stop you being a human and just up and down and moody, you know? So there's that layer, there's that layer in there as well. But again, it's embracing that. It's seeing that the humanity in that, and this is what it is to be a human being. Mm. There's ups and that, and almost like I say, getting a bit of a buzz and thinking, well, I'm alive. Come on, what's yes, yeah, really going to do? What can I do? What's going to make me feel better? I don't know what you yeah. But you know what I mean, though? Some days you just can't, you can't even do that. Like sometimes you're just fed up. I mean, you could come out of it, it can help a bit. If you're in proper grief or you're in proper upset or, you, or you're really, really, really happy, it's hard to get down about it. But it's like what I mean as well is it's seeing that that it's it's almost knowing. I know this is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. I'll you know it'll you know pass and it'll Yeah. Rather than again it's back to living in the moment like last time. If you just oh my god, life's horrendous, what's the point? There's no meaning I feel rubbish because of this. You're too in the moment, aren't you? Whereas yeah when you're a bit more of an absurdist view you can zoom out and go, Yeah, but there is no meaning, but it gives you some growth. Well, that ability to go meta, to go outside of yourself, you know, as if you were a drone looking down, that, that is another skill. I think that's a separate episode, the ability to, to have the skill of how you manage your self-perceptions and, and perspectives, how we say not perceptions, how you can use perspectives and zoning out of yourself to see. But even, you know, I mean, like you see, in the actual lived life, it's it's not as easy as the logical life, you know. Well, that's maybe a good... 
we we're going to finish on, well, we're going to start with it, but I, I forgot to mention it. You know, Camus' quote, the absurd is lucid reason, not in its limits. Yeah. And I said to you, I was trying to read around it, and I, I just couldn't really get my head around exactly what he was trying to get at. Yeah. But it sounds it sounds like it should sound like a good quote. So I don't know what your, what meaning do you take from that as what he was getting at? It, it's everything that my PhD was about. You've got the live life of experiential unfolding, becoming complex chaos you know just just being in the world that heidegger said first and foremost and then you've got the conceptual logical version of it which, which is reason and well the reason you feel like that is because of this this and this you've, you've got this because of that and, and it's a, it's the outside in view not the inside looking out view yeah i'm in the fishbowl i'm looking out and that's a more a, you know different kind of ontology than a looking at the being as from the outside in commenting on people playing in the football match is different on the than being on the outside talking about it you know in a, in a weird way so that was what the Camus saying there we say that quote again uh, the absurd is lucid reason not in its limits yeah so lucid reason like really lucid i've really nailed this i've really got this nailed you know i've sorted this out i know exactly why we lost i know exactly what's going on but you got to notice your limits to that reason. And that, to me, is the bridge between the live life and the rational life. And that's where we exist in that gap. And my PhD was trying to be that guy, was trying to be that bridge to say, oh, you know, you've all gone a little bit too logical and rational, in my opinion. And over on this side, there's actually all this real lift moment to moment unfolding that a person feels and lives through. But you never take that into account in all your models and all your diagrams and all your things, you know. So, like, I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're just two different ways. And I think that I think that quote sums it up. Lucid reasoning, noticing its limits. Simple. He says, "Ben Brown." Right. I always have a little bit of a question or a thought provoker at the end, so I just thought I would finish on on this one. If you were to accept that you don't matter. That your name, ego, reputation, families, friends, and looks will soon be gone. How does the way you understand your own time, money, and energy change? <laughs> so, just considering some of those things and the the ultimate meaninglessness of that. And I, I think another question, a good question, would be, you know, what what are you doing at the moment that you're a little bit confused about, and are you too rational in your thinking about it? And, and would looking at it in a bit of an absurd way help and, and take out a little bit of that seriousness you might have around the issue? Oh, I'd kid. When we dance, the journey itself is the point. When we play music, you will simply become completely absorbed in sound. And therefore you will find yourself living in an eternal now in which there is no past, and there is no future, and there is no thing called difference between yourself and the world of nature outside you. This is red. This is green. This is something. This is nothing. This is solid. This is space. Between yourself and the world of nature outside you.